Adam Sedgwick, Roderick Murchison, we could go through the list of those. They all were almost to a man catastrophists. Mm -hmm. They believed that the features and things that they were seeing in the landscape could only be explained by means of catastrophic outsized type events. What, what happened when you get sort of to the mid 19th century is you had um, Playfair, Lyle, and Hutton were the three who essentially codified the uniformitarian uh, interpretation of Earth history. And again, like I said, it was very potent, very powerful for understanding sedimentary processes, understanding erosional and depositional processes, all of these things. But it came, became codified as dogma by the time you get to the establishment of geolog geology as an academic discipline in the late 19th century. They wanted to basically come up with this textbook framework that could be codified and taught as dogma, right? And, and because of this controversy between, let's say, the biblical literalists who said, well, all of the features that we're looking at, you know, were created by Noah's flood or whatever, or created within seven days, that controversy and that battle between the, the fundamentalist religious worldview and the scientific worldview went on for several centuries. And even in the 19th century, you know, the, 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 um, the pogroms and the heresies, the suppression of heresies were still fresh in people's minds. So it was like, okay, we're going to, we're going to put the study of earth history onto a scientific footing and we're going to do away with things like Noah's flood. Right. So it's right. like we're liberated from it. We don't have to think of everything that we're seeing as being the consequence of Noah's flood. Well, mm -hmm. what they did was they went to, they went too far. They went to the other extreme. And so now everything really became millions of years, millions of years, one grain of sand, one drop of water at a time. And if you've got enough time, see, one of the things that was, that allowed for that change in perspective was the fact that we shifted from a, 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 a model of earth history that only allowed for say six or 7,000 years to now we've right. got millions of years. So it's like what they were able to do is to say that if you're thinking that all of the things that we see in the land around us were created, you know, in a geological eye blink, you know, 6,000 years ago, that necessarily implies catastrophic rates of change. And, and now we shift to millions of years we don't need catastrophes anymore because we've got we can now bring in the, the time element to say that it takes millions of years. We can create Grand Canyon in millions of years. We don't need Noah's flood to create Grand Canyon, for example. You know, one, one of the things I've come to appreciate about this information that you share ad infinitum uh, on on podcasts and things is that I've come to believe that my own religious worldview, which I understand everyone has their own unique religious worldview, and they've got different flavors of uh, Christianity from anything from everything is entirely symbolic that they're reading in the pages of the Bible to everything is terribly literal, and how dare you say otherwise, and everything in between. But I've come to believe that much of the understanding that we've been able to gain in the sciences and various fields of inquiry, like the, our, your geological studies, for example, or our understanding of the cosmos, isn't necessarily at odds with the religious texts. It's just a matter of understanding both both fields of inquiry, the, both the religious on the one hand and the scientific on the other. Is that your what's your view on that? My view is entirely um, in in line with that. That that I look at the religious texts as being sources of profound information. Um, again, talking about future podcasts, I'm not prepared to do it today, but it'd be fun to <laughs> fun, maybe interesting to yeah. go through the Noachite accounts of the Great Flood. Compare those, for example, to some of the other accounts, the Greek account of Deucalion and the Greek the Great Flood. There, the Sumerian account of Utnapishtim and the story of Gilgamesh. And look at the the parallels there, but also to see that there's an underlying strata of scientific plausibility when you take, you kind of look at it through this, this altered lens of catastrophism. And you realize that ancient scripture, ancient mythology, legends, and so on are replete with catastrophism. So in a way, we've come full circle. See, our ancestors fully believed in a catastrophic world. And and believed in a catastrophic world right up until the advent of, of modern geological theory. So what happened is that you had 
geological uniformitarianism or gradualism entrenched through most of the 20th century. And of course, there were major exceptions to that. One of those, the most prominent in my mind, was the work of J. Harlan Bretz, who, who uh, studied the great Missoula floods, or mm -hmm. Spokane floods, as he called them, out in the Pacific Northwest. And when he first uh, <clears throat> published papers in the early 1920s, proposing there had been these gi a gigantic flood that had sculpted the landscape of the Pacific Northwest, he was pretty much dismissed as a crackpot. And right. The, the geological community at that point that had become established over like the previous two generations said, OK, we have to stamp out this heresy because he's trying to bring us right back again to, you know, biblical literalism and Noah's flood and things like that. This is getting dangerously close to, you know, supernatural stuff, right? because we haven't seen anything on the scale that he's invoking in modern times. Therefore, it didn't exist. And when they challenged him to provide, okay, you say there was these gigantic floods, right? Well, what was the, the cause? What was the source of these floods? He wasn't able to come up with anything. He said, well, it had to have been some accelerated melting of the great ice sheets that we, at this point now, ice ages have been well established, right? Primarily for, through the work of, of uh, Louis Agassi. But by this time, Ice, sheets have be, uh, ice ages have become firmly established. So he said, well, it must have been some accelerated melting of the ice sheets. And the response was, well, what causes an accelerated melting? And he I didn't really have anything. So they said, well, <laughs> right. if you can't provide a cause for these floods, right. they didn't happen. That was that was the, basically the, the response. His response to that, well, I don't know what happened. But look, I've spent, you know, at this point, you know, up to like 20 years documenting discrete uh, types of evidence that all together, you know, like you could take one thing, for example, let's say a recessional cataract, which is a horseshoe shaped cataract in the bedrock, similar to uh, horseshoe falls at, at uh, Niagara Falls, right? Or you can look at a valley train extending off of a, off of a hill that, that is two miles long filled with boulders, huge boulders, right? Or you might look at, at potholes. I mentioned potholes earlier. Um, there's a whole suite of features that you could go through, maybe to, uh, you know, 20 to two dozen different types of features created in the landscapes by events that we'll call outsized events. And what Brett's did was said, okay, if you take any one of those, maybe a gradualistic scenario would be exp uh, sufficiently explanatory. But when you take the whole suite of features, you know, modern gradualistic processes cannot explain the features of, for example, the channel scablands. And when you look at each of these elements and you put it together, there's only one conclusion, yeah, that there were these gigantic floods and they can explain the full suite of, uh, of evidence, of diverse types of evidence. 